dear friend of ours. Uh, she has uh, helped us a lot in the past, most especially our first George Washington birthday ball, which, by the way, is coming up February 24th. Put that on the calendar. Uh, Eve has also helped us out a lot in the past few years. Uh, also, our uh, colonial fair, my fact, is demonstrating some of the colonial cooking, which, by the way, is uh, Eve's topic tonight. So, with great pleasure, I introduce an evening with Eve King. domestic skills interpreter, living history interpreter for about 12 years now. Um, I learned, I started in the area of living history at Rubber Mountain Science Center and we've got our contingency of uh, great mountain people here that have been with for a long time. Uh, so I started there and uh, one of the things that I started learning about 10 years ago from our cook at Rubber Mountain Science Center was, was early cooking. And, not just colonial, but 18th century, early 19th century cooking. Uh, so I was I was uh, very lucky to start working with uh, Carolyn Jones, who actually was at Walnut Grove for many years too. And from there, I started volunteering at the Shield Museum in Gastonia, North Carolina. They have an 18th century backcountry farm, and um, started working with some of the, the people there and expanding my skills and knowledge of of. 18th century cooking and practicing it, so experimenting, and it just continues. I've been very lucky to have a lot of good mentors and um, and to continue this. So hopefully, my goal tonight is just to kind of give you a broad overview of early 18th century, not just colonial, because we wanted after the Revolutionary War. Uh, Federalist period, so we're you know learning a little bit of knowledge about the time period, what the foods were, and um, and even early 19th century because you didn't see a whole lot of changes. So hopefully, if you're interested in this type of cooking or this the foods of the time period, this uh, might give you a little bit of insight as to what is typical, and um, and then I can talk to you about how you get started. Okay, so. Do. So what is colonial cooking? Well, to me it's a food culture. And like any food culture, they've got, um, there are different aspects that make up that food culture. Okay? And there are regional differences in the 18th century, like what was typical down in the southern region is going to be different than what you might find up closer in areas like New York, New England, those areas. Uh, so some of those, the elements of the food culture are your flavors, all right? So spices, uh, what you typically see used in the foods to create this. So your, your spices, your herbs, things like that. And we'll go more into this uh, as we go through. Availability of specific ingredients. What was available? What did they have? What were the typical fruits and vegetables of the time period? Now, granted, a lot of them are what today we call heirloom varieties. Some of them are still available today, but many are not. So when you do this type of cooking, it's a lot of times you're, you're doing more of an adaptation or an interpretation of it. It's not going to be exactly, but you can try to get it as close as possible. Uh, meats. What, what were they eating? You know, all of these things take are, are very specific. And of course, methods of cooking. How did we create these foods? Everybody knows that it was mainly cooked over a fire, but there are there's more than just cooking over a fire when you're talking about this time period. And presentation is something that you see a lot in 18th century cooking. What that means is how did they present it at table? Now, that is more specific to your middling and upper classes that when you presented foods, you wanted it to look a certain way. 
And that's because you wanted to give an impression of, of being of a, a higher class than um, the class systems were very important at this time period. So our influences in this area, and I'm going to talk specifically more about the, the Carolinas and what the influences were on in our food in this time period for, from the Carolinas. Uh, so a lot of the influence, predominantly English. We see a lot of that. Uh, the, the resources we have are, you know, the cookbooks, things like that, were mainly English. But in our region, you do also see some other uh, groups that have definitely influenced the food uh, uh, around here. So for the, the, the Germans and the Moravian communities, how many of you ever been to Old Salem? In Old Salem? Okay. So you have uh, the German influence. Uh, you also have the Native American influence. And the Native American influence you see, uh, such as corn, uh, you've got squash, and you've got pumpkins, things like that that we see a lot of, and the African slaves, your enslaved people. So they really, the, the African slaves contributed a lot to what we consider Southern cuisine today. And some of the Southern cuisine you think about are sweet potatoes. Um, okra, the rice culture of the Low Country. Uh, so these were very common, very big influences in in our food here. So what did they eat? How do we know what they ate? Well, primary resources. There's a lot of primary resources: manuscripts, diaries, and cookbooks. So a lot of cookbooks, and I do have some samples of cookbooks up here. Uh, some of them are actually reprints of original cookbooks, uh, and some are, um, you know, uh, some are compilations uh, written by other uh, food historians who have taken together different, you know, looking at different manuscripts and diaries as well, and uh, and have created books to give you a, an idea. So, you know, a lot of girls would write down, when they were younger, they of course were preparing for that day when they would maybe get married, so they would keep a diary or write a receipt book. In this time period, recipes are called receipts. So you see that, a lot of people use it interchangeably, but it's more commonly referred to as a receipt. Uh, and so young ladies would write receipts down, and they would have it for, you know, when they, were married and running their own households. Uh, sometimes it would be these recipes would be written into other books. For example, here I've got a recipe for muffins, and this is from uh, Harriet Avery, who had a poetry and receipt book, 1815 to 1858. But she was out of North Carolina, and the recipe is for what today we would think of as English muffins. And so we've got one quart of flour, two eggs, a spoonful of sugar, half a pint of milk, an ounce of butter, two tablespoons of fresh yeast, a little salt, make a stiff batter at bedtime, set it to rise for breakfast. If it rises too much or gets soft, work in a little flour, let it rise, grill in rings on a grill, greased, on a hook over the fire, swing out to pour and turn. That was her recipe, how she actually wrote it into her book. Uh, the other thing, there are really good references in other diaries to things that might have been eaten, more common foods. Because you can look at the cookbooks, and like a cookbook today, right? It's going to always give you the best. Do we all eat this way every day? I mean, the cookbooks you have in your house, I don't know about you ladies, but I don't. Or any of you gentlemen that could. Yeah, you, know, you have lots of cookbooks. And you go, well, how many of the recipes do I really ever use for this? And do I follow it all the time? Oh, probably not. Many people in this time, depending on how what your socioeconomic background was, you may not have even owned a cookbook. It would have just been what you wrote down and had, or what you remember growing up learning to cook. Uh, I think today we've gotten into this uh, mode where we are, we do have access 
we can afford code books, we can afford to look things up digitally. You know, so we, we tend not to remember as much or cook from that basic memory that we grew up doing. Uh, so I think there are some differences. But, so Everyday Fair is interesting when you start, this is a book, uh, Backcountry Housewife. If any of you ever want to get started in early cooking, this is a great book. Kay Moss, who was uh, started the 18th century backcountry farm at the Shio Museum, uh, has written numerous books, and this is one of hers. And this is kind of a, a guide for a lot of living history sites when they first start uh, doing some cooking. Uh, she's got original recipes, references, and uh, in here, everyday fair, she's got some references to what uh, some people actually ate, which is interesting because it's not what you think in the cookbooks. So the following meals are, this is uh, mid-afternoon or main meal of the day. The following meals are mentioned in the early Moravian records. In the winter of 1758 when food was scarce, meat and carrots, sausage and dried pumpkins, dumplings, pig's feet and heads and turnips, beans and butter, meat and dried pumpkins, dumplings and radish, meat and turnips, meat and sauerkraut. <laughs> Love um, The Moravians are wonderful because they kept records of everything. So that really helps us when we're doing even, um, you know, we're not a Moravian community, but it helps us get an idea of what people did on a daily basis because the mundane, most people didn't write down that information. The Moravians did. They wrote down laundry days, <laughs> lots of information. Uh, yes. So George Washington. A reference here to George Washington. His professor. Uh, his his breakfast preference was very quite ordinary. Three small Indian hoe cakes. And I was talking to a gentleman about uh, hoe cakes. Hoe cakes were basically cornmeal, water, and salt. That was the basic. Okay, now some people would add things to it, such as milk or molasses, if it was available, but generally it was just your cornmeal and your water and salt, very plain. And he also, and as many dishes of tea, he also made a reference in that he liked um, chocolate. So hot chocolate was a very, a drink that was common in this time period that many people drank. So, uh, good coffee, bread and butter, breakfast. Tea, coffee, chocolate, which are at present even the country people's daily breakfast. So that gives you an idea of more of what the common man ate on a daily basis. So here are some front pieces of a couple of cookbooks. And um, I always find it interesting when you start looking at covers of books from this time period because they put a lot of information on that cover. So the lady's assistant over here, ah, wait, hold on. <laughs> okay, so the lady's assistant, this is written in 1797, and uh, she goes into, let me see if I can read it from here. Can't read it on the screen, sorry. So, uh, the lady's assistant for the regulation and supplying of the table with a complete system of cookery, etc. The, oops. And select a bill of fare properly disposed for family dinners of five dishes to two courses of 11 and 15, which I'm sure <coughs> most women did not cook unless you were a very wealthy family and you had somebody else doing those five dishes. Eleven courses, uh, and then she goes on to with several desserts, and also she talks about in her book as well poisons, um, the kitchen poisons. As well. Now this one is this is actually Amelia Simmons, and Amelia Simmons is considered she, her cookbook is really the, considered the first American cookbook. Most of the cookbooks were coming out of England or Germany, um, but Amelia Simmons was actually, her books were written and uh, printed in New York. Not a whole lot of information about her. She says she is an American orphan, 
I know a few people have tried to do research on her to figure out who she was, where she was, you know, a little bit more about her life, but it, they, they have not found a whole lot of information. So they're still, still researching that. But her cookbook, she has a couple, she had a couple of them, and um, I've got a copy up here so that you know, when, you, when we're done, you can take a look at it. And so hers is a very good basic. It tells you this was um, a lot of the stuff that probably most people were, were cooking at the time. Anybody has any questions while I'm talking, please? Let me know. So one of the uh, challenges when you're doing this type of cooking is actually deciphering the recipe. And I'm sorry this isn't bigger so you can see it better. Um, so here we have um, Charles Carter, Carter, who his book is 1730. Now, Charles, Charles, Car Charles Carter actually was, this is not a recipe that every day, he, even though he, made, he wrote a cookbook, this was, would not have been a cookbook that most people would have purchased. Uh, he was actually a cook to the Duke of Argyle, and Lord Cornwallis, and a couple other people he had listed that he had cooked for. So we're talking about a very wealthy household and um, was cooking for large, uh, large quantities for a large amount of people. So uh, and we're going to compare this to a couple of recipes, the same recipe that is from other cooks. So this is an oleo podrida, or a Spanish oleo. Uh, and I'm not going to read through the whole thing. But so take beef, pork, veal, mutton, of each two pieces of a pound a piece, lard half of it with gross lard, seasoned well, roast it brown till half enough, then take several sorts of fowl, is two pheasants, four partridges, two ducks, <laughs> four teals, four woodcocks, four plovers, four chickens, four tame pigeons, eight squabs, eight snipes, 36 larks, uh, lard half of this with seasoned lard, roast half of the fowl off brown till half ready, then take several sorts of roots and herbs such as carrots, turnips, parsnips, cabbage, celery, and dive, cabbage, lettuce, and cardoons or sherdoons, savoys, uh, leeks, onions, and any roots or herbs you can get according to the season of the year. Cleanse and blanch all these off, tying your celery and dive and leeks and bunches and Okay, so you get the idea. <laughs> so first of all, if you notice, what he does is he kind of lists all the, everything together, and then as you're reading through, you're going, oh wait, I have to do this step first before I do that step. Unlike modern uh, recipes, you know, where we're used to having the ingredients, the amount we need to use, and then step-by-step -step directions, you don't find that in this time period. You really have to read through the entire recipe before you go back and start again, because it'll give you something that you, you just start from the beginning, all of a sudden you get halfway through and you realize, wait, I should have done this first, and uh, so that's, that's one of the challenges. And then of course your challenge is also understanding the words. What do the terminologies mean? Uh, there are a lot of resources out there that do talk about that, but um, it, it is, there's still a lot of food historians that I, I know that Everybody talks about, well, what does this mean? We aren't sure because the terminology changed and it's, it's kind of lost at this point. Uh, but we try, we muddle through, and uh, you can try to get it as close as possible. So, of course, this is a very, very expensive dish and not for the average person. But what it does show you is what was available. And so when you're trying to interpret the food of the time period, this does help you know what ingredients were out there. What were they using? Now here we've got three other ones. So this is uh, Carter as well. Again, this is called a hodgepodge. So this is really a pared down version of that recipe. Uh, this is uh, Rumfeld. This, so this one is the same thing, the oleo podrido, but a lot simpler. <laughs> so this was he was he was a German author and he just talked about his daily eating 
like he would place in a pot, dry a small piece of bacon, two pounds of meat, one pound of veal, a young chicken, and a young pigeon. Uh, when the meat had been skimmed and, and uh, <coughs> cooked sufficiently, I added whatever roots, herbs, I can't read the words, vegetables were available in the market, and so, and then he goes on and talks about that when it was time to serve it, he actually would take all the meat out of the dish, oops, and put it, and put it, serve it separate. So you cooked everything in the dish, but then you removed the meat and served it on separate platters. That's that presentation. So unlike where you know, most of us would be cooking all the meats in it, just dishing up that way. They didn't do that. So here's uh, Mary Randolph, the Virginia housewife, which is uh, eight, early 1800s. She has the same dish, the oleo, that we saw in the first, uh, the first recipe. And it's a little much more pared down. Okay, but same thing. So you see these recipes just changing slightly over time. <clears throat> so this here is showing you, uh, when we talk about spices and availability, this is what a lot of people would have in their spice boxes uh, to keep, to season all their foods. So this one is 1739, the house, housekeeper's pocketbook. Sarah Harrison, and she recommends that you advise you to lay in some store of spices bought at some noted reputable grocers. Make sure it's a reputable grocer when you go. Uh, nutmegs, cloves, mace, cinnamon, ginger, Jamaica pepper. Jamaica pepper is all spice. Uh, black pepper and long pepper. Long pepper is another type of, like they had black, white, and I'm not familiar enough with long pepper but I've seen pictures of it. That you may have everyone ready at hand, and for sweet herbs, you should always have them dry for you, kept in paper bags from the dust, such as red sage, thyme, sweet marjoram, mint, penny oil, and all such others as you may want to season. Any dish you are about to prepare, neither ought you be without shallots, onions, and such like, besides oranges and lemon peel dry, Capers, pickled walnuts, pickled cucumbers, cucumbers and mango, anchovies, olives, pickled mushrooms, or mushrooms dried and powdered, or ketchup, or mushroom juice, or mushroom ketchup. But if you have a garden, and the most of the sweet herbs may be gathered at any time, except the mint or the pot sweet margarine, which last are not good in cold weather. Okay. So a lot of these we're familiar with. How many of you have ever uh, know what mace is? Mace has really lost favor, uh, but I see it coming back. It, it's been used in early cooking and still used in Middle Eastern cooking in those areas for a long time. But I'll, I'll pass around some mace. This is one of my little spice boxes. Okay, so your nutmeg and cinnamon would have been bought whole and grated. So this is an example of a grater. And mace, uh, nutmeg has actually three parts to it. So it has an outer shell, like you find with most nuts, and then it has a, a little thin layer around it, and that is what mace comes from. And then the inner nut is the nutmeg. So, pass around. Mace is, has the scent and flavor of nutmeg, but it's not as strong. So here's your nutmeg, right? And then this is the blade mace that would be growing, it would be around it, surrounding that nut. So it would just be covered with that. So I'll pass this mace around. I'm not going to snip it, hold it. How does it grow? Is it bush? I think it's, yeah, I think it's like a tree. Does anybody know? Uh, honestly, I should know, but I don't. It's a tree, yes. So. And, and most of these spices, of course, they were imported. Except the herb. So mushroom powder, they talk about that, some mushroom powder. Uh, ketchups. 
Most ketchups were uh, either made out of mushrooms or walnuts. Think of Worcestershire sauce, and that's what you, is uh, your ketchup. So here's a recipe here for an English ketchup, and it's um, white vinegar, white wine vinegar, uh, 12 cloves, a shallot, white wine as well, anchovies add, added to it, and so then you'd also put in mace, ginger, and cloves, and a spoonful of pepper, and you'd let them all boil together, and then you'd strain it off, and that would be your, um, your ketchup, and that would be added to sauces, brown sauces and things. Your oranges and lemons and limes, because you know they were seasonal, and many of them, although they were growing in the 18th century, they did start growing, I think, about 1730s or so, they, in South Carolina, they did start growing citrus fruits. Uh, and so they became available before that, and, and probably still a lot were being brought in from the Caribbean islands and you know, areas like the Barbados and stuff. So what they do, because it was also very expensive, is right now you know what to do. When you have those little oranges or lemons that are sitting there on your counter and they're drying and shriveling, don't throw them away. That actually is what they would have, and then you would grate that, and you can actually really get a wonderful um, grated dry peel out of it. So rather than having it fresh, you would also do a lot of pickling of peels to preserve it for later on use, or candying it, you know, doing a sugar bath and making like your candy like you use a fruit case. Uh, peppers, cayenne, so you take your cayenne and dry them out and then this would be ground up. Okay, so sweet herbs, you'll find that term a lot. And sweet herbs, this is just a few of what sweet herbs are. Uh, things that you wouldn't think of as a sweet herb, such as shallots or garlic, were called sweet herbs as well. Um, sweet spices, so your, you know, your basics, mace, not mace, cinnamon, sugar. That's just some of them. Savory spice, pepper, salt, cloves, mace, and nutmeg. So that can be sweet or savory. And you do find a lot of mace and nutmeg used in meat dishes. So here is a list of some of the, the vegetables or that or the fruits that were available seasonally. And that's what they would do is, is cook by the season. So when it was fresh, of course, you can eat it and, um, and then preserve what you could. And many of the cookbooks would actually, they would list it by season and what dishes to serve depending on the month of the year. So they reference a lot of that. And so that gives you another idea. So if I'm going to be cooking something in, um, if I wanted to make sausages, I wouldn't be making sausages in the summertime because that's not when you slaughtered your hog. Your sausages and your all that would be made fall, winter, depending on where you live. Uh, your apples, right now we have apples and pumpkins are in season. So they would be using them, drying them, and uh, to preserve or making whatever foods they put out of the fresh before. Uh, blueberries, you know, if I have blueberries, we're eating them fresh, and then I might be making a jam out of it. So everything was very seasonal. <clears throat> so methods of cooking, of course, fire. You have to use a fire, right? Um, roasting, broiling, boiling, frying, baking. Those were the basic methods of cooking. And um, there's some other things you can, you know, uh, jugging. We were just, uh, I was just talking to Tom about that, about he was asking about steaming. And I have not come across a reference yet for steaming at that time. So let's look at some kitchens. Okay, this is a kitchen I would love to cook in. However, I don't think I'll ever be able to cook in this kitchen. Uh, does anybody have any idea what kitchen that is? Is it a kitchen? Nope. Huh? No. Uh, well, you're, you're up there with the people. 
think 18th century. I think somebody who just loved food and uh, who did a lot of experimentation, had a lot of important, a lot of vegetables. And Thomas Jefferson, Monticello. They actually found references to his kitchen and recreated this. He loved French food and French cooking. So you know, he sent actually one of his slaves, who was his cook, off to France to study with master cooks or chefs um, to learn the techniques of French cooking, so they could bring them back and do it in their kit uh, in, at Monticello. So one thing over here, this is where they would make the sauces. So if you needed to cook these really nice, rich sauces of French cooking, uh, I mean, this is just that is, I think. Put your fire in there, and then up there are your pots. And you can uh, you put all those fine sauces that you really have to control the heat temperature. And we have a bake oven here. So there's your bake oven. And then your main cooking fire, uh, up in, you know, your hearth here. And uh, that's called a, a, I don't know if that was a clock jack, but a spit jack. So this is this was used uh, for roasting, and, and it made it more automated, rather than having a small child sit there and turn the spit in front of the fire. It made it much easier. So here's a close-up of their fire place. And uh, so there's the, there's that, uh, there's a spit jack. So we have a couple of other elements that you find in a lot of uh, kitchens. So right here, this is called a crane. And a crane, if you had it, like we have one at Rubber Mountain, if you have a, a middling to upper class family, you might have a crane in your fireplace. What that crane does is it actually pulls out and pushes in, and that's a way to control the temperature of your pots. Because you don't always want everything boiling right over the heat. In fact, a lot of cooking holes. So you have trammels, you have roasting mechanisms here. This is just a very long skillet so that as those fires do get very, very hot. Um, this is in Williamsburg and you can see that they have a very large hearth area. In fact, many kitchens would have an entirely stone floor which allowed you to pull out and do a lot of your cooking out here away from fire because you know when you put them for a large amount of people and uh, you, you can't there's only so much space you have in your fireplace uh, so here they're showing you know pulling the pot out and building up your fire around the pot which create the heat and and cooking in there and then you have your other pots hanging there looks kind of messy no <laughs> It's really nice. Actually, I don't have a lot. Hmm, yeah, I don't know. I cook there too. That would be fun. So here, in here, you have more simplistic cooking. Um, so, however, not all the people. This like this is the. Uh, oops. So here is this is the Sixth North Carolina Regiment at one of their events cooking, and they do have all of the nice. Uh, you know, metal rigging uh, to, to cook over and demonstrating that. And here I've got it here as well, the uprights. Some people, though, if you were hunting, you probably wouldn't even have that. It would just be very basic. You might cook with a rock or, um, you know, just lay some sticks over a fire with rocks and, and you could roast and cook that way. So roasting, here we go. We have a nice pork roast. By the end of the summer, hoping you're so here's a pork roast and studded with cloves, and then the uh, we basted it actually with a wine sauce. The griddle. Remember, I was reading the the recipe for the muffins. Well, here's a griddle right here hanging over the fireplace, and there's your metal rings to cook them to cook that dough in. Uh, this here is is called jugging, and like that other pot that you saw back here. So that pot right there, and that one's got a handle, but you could do the same thing with a ceramic or with a, a the uh, your redware pots or your horse the, those types of pots. And that's what I have here. Is this is down inside? The food is in there. Uh, it's an early crock pot. 
You put all of your, your meat, your vegetables, your spices in it, really very little to no liquid at all, close it up tight, and then you either cook it in water, uh, very hot water in the pot, or you could do like the other one where you take the pot and you build your coals around it. And it will just cook all that food together, then the flavors melt together, the meat will fall off the bone. It's delicious. It's a fabulous way to work our products. I always like to say that nothing is new, it's just updated or reinvented. But a lot of the things that we see that are popular today, drinks, things like that, they've been around for centuries. All right, so here we've got jugging, and there you can see the pot as I pulled it out of the out of the water there and pulling out the meat. Baking. Now, many people, if they were lucky, actually have a bake oven next to their fireplace. So baking was usually done maybe once a week, and that's because to get that oven up so hot in order to bake. Uh, it takes a lot of wood and a lot of time. So what they would usually do is you'd stack all the wood in there, light it on fire, close the door, put the door on it, and let that burn down. Then you'd scrape out all the hot coals that are there and make sure it cooled down to about 400 degrees. Then you would start baking your breads. Once that oven slowly cooled down, after you pull your breads out, then you can put your pies in. After that, then you can put your, your uh, cookies, which we call cakes. You can put those in. So as that temperature drops, you would still utilize that oven. Uh, you just would not cook everything at the same time. And so that's why your baking was only done maybe once a week. Many people didn't have an oven, though. Uh, oh, also you could use your oven for drying your herbs. And that is one way that is recommended many of the, the cookies is drying your herbs in those ovens. That oven would probably be warm anyways from your daily cooking, so you could just put those herbs on a little baking sheet and stick it in the oven to dry them out. And it would dry faster, and you wouldn't have the problems of dust and, and other things. Now, this here is showing a larger oven. Some communities actually would have a large um, mud oven that they would fire up once a week, and everybody could bring their breads over and bake them all in the community oven. But if you didn't have any of those, I can still bake. I can make bread, I can make cakes, pies, cookies, whatever you need. And they can all be done in a simple Dutch oven. And here we have the Dutch ovens here. You put your hot coals underneath it, hot coals on top. That lid is recessed. So you pile your hot coals in there and you create an oven. You can bake everything. So bill of fare, or your presentation. Okay, mine, I would fail the presentation aspect. Mine's not very pretty over there. But this was important, and in many of the cookbooks, they do show you how to set the table for each course, what to put where. So symmetry was something that they liked, um, and if you were wealthy, you would do that. There had also, between courses, they were known to bring out dishes of food put them on the table, but you didn't eat it. They were just there to make sure the table looked nice. Um, yes. So a lot of times you would have your meats in the middle, and then you would have your salads or your vegetables off to the side. And as far as I understand, and I may be incorrect on this, I'm not sure, but they didn't like pass the food as much like we do today. They would eat more from what was in front of you, and that's pretty much what you ate. So this is from that one cookbook uh, that I showed you before in the 1797 one. And this is one of her family dinners of seven dishes. <laughs> I think the only time I ever do seven dishes is probably Thanksgiving or something event. Rarely do I seven dishes. So she shows you and how to set the table. And that's what this shows. This shows you how to place the foods on the table. So like I said, most of the cookbooks do have these references in them. So afterwards, pull up and look through them. They're usually in the back of the books. So that's the lady's assistant. 
Charlie Mason's 1787. Okay, but here is an idea of presentation. This is the Shio Museum's 18th century backcountry farm uh, during a Christmas program that they have every year. And that is also coming up December the 9th, and it usually starts in the afternoon, 2 to 6 p.m. Wonderful event, highly recommend it. I'm usually there, so I'm um, usually cooking. Fitz Williams is usually there. He's one of the great actors that comes out for it. Uh, it's a wonderful time, and you do actually get to try the food as well. So, but here she's got the table set with the collation of sweets, as we call it. And you can see how pretty it is, because we're, we're showing off. We're showing off to people that are visiting us, and for family and friends. So here's a couple of the cakes, uh, with the, the frosting is meringue. This here is a silva, which you will get to try tonight. So wish. All right, presentation. This is called Salmon Gundy, and uh, there is uh, a group of us that from the that work out of the Shield. We're called the Pig of Knowledge, and what it is is that we take a certain aspect of something could be food related or um, something from that the 18th century, and we do our own interpretation of it. So here's a recipe that we all got the same recipe for the salmagundi. Now salmagundi was uh, like a salad. If you think about a Caesar salad, right? It has meat, it has cheeses, and um, okay, cob salad. Cob salad or Caesar salad? Cob salad, I'm sorry, cob salad. So this is the same thing. So it would be meats, eggs, uh, pickles, all sorts of pickles, and then you would present it on a plate. So these are the these are four different cooks' interpretation of the same recipe. So where to start? How many of you are interested in learning to cook from this time period? Okay, I have to ask my daughter mommy. Does anybody know who that is? Mark. <laughs> Mark. Wait, who that here? <laughs> it's taken off of the screen, uh, but uh, this is more than that. So, so where to start? Well, um, you really just have to jump in with both feet, um, and uh, or knives and forks and spoons. But like as I said before, there are some great starter books. Um, the Backcountry Housewife came off. I highly recommend that one. I use many of her receipts. Uh, she has interpreted many of them to a more modern interpretation. Uh, because when you read some of these, they are very large portions. And uh, you probably would not want to do them. So she has, some of them she has already given different little ones for much smaller increments. Uh, the other one would be, uh, well, she also has this book, Seeking the Historical so she has um, Seeking the Historical Cook. This really goes into depth and compares a lot of different receipts uh, from different areas and, um, and manuscripts and things. And then the other one is, this is a really good book written by one of the former uh, cooks at Colonial Williamsburg. So they have taken the historical recipes and they have interpreted it to modern recipes and they talk about how to cook over a hearth or how to do it at home in your oven. So this is a really good one to start with if you just want to try the foods from the time periods. Uh, this does go, I think, into the early 1800s as far as some of the recipes that she does have in this book. Then when you start wanting to get a little bit more become creative, start looking at more of these things, you can actually get reprints of some of the early books such as Hannah Glass's The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy. This is an 18th century uh, cookbook, but it's a little more challenging. Okay. And then Amelia Simmons' cookbook, and there's others. Martha Washington's cookbook, which was based off of her manuscripts and her diaries. 
this is very difficult. Even I read through it, and um, some of hers are dating back to the early 1700s, and it's a little harder to understand what she's writing about. But if you enjoy reading and learning about the history of cooking, this is excellent. Um, the lady who transcribed this is Karen Hess. She is a well-known food historian, and in many of the early cookbooks, such as these, she has also written introductions in these cookbooks and, and uh, will make commentaries in them, so it kind of helps people. One of the things that I want you to remember as well in this time period, there are some other ones from that are very specific to our area, to the South Carolina especially. So the Carolina Rice Kitchen, and Karen has again writing about it, and this gives you a lot of, the, there was a difference in some of the foods that we had between the low country and as you started moving further up. Up uh, in our area it was more corn based, uh, yet in the low country it was rice because of the rice culture down there. Uh, so Johnny Cakes or Journey Cakes, they actually were making them out of rice. And um, to me, I actually prefer those to the corn ones. It's just personal words. And then you have this one, which is the receipt book of Harriet um, Pinking Horrid. 1770 and the colonial cookbook. So this was her recipes that she had written down that have been transcribed and put into another cookbook. So all of these are still available today, as well as others. Uh, when you talk about vegetables and what might have been grown, there are some great references here. Um, so one is the vegetable gardening, Colonial Williamsburg. This is a wonderful book. Uh, he does talk about some of the so different methods of growing uh, your vegetables in the 18th century, some of the things, and then referencing some of the early varieties. Um, also, Thomas Jefferson, of course, had did a lot of research in varieties, and you can find that information, I believe, online. And then this one is being reprinted. This is uh, Williamsburg Joseph Prentice. He was an, uh, a lawyer in Williamsburg. And he did a monthly calendar and garden book. And he told you exactly what to, what to plant, when to plant it, um, harvesting, all that. So this is really interesting if you want to do some comparisons of what was available. So me. And questions? Yes? What do they get the spices? I mean, you're a farmer in the back country. Yeah, you, you would have actually, right, so depending on how wealthy you were or whatever, but many people would buy, so they got and buy the spices and had them, so they'd get them from a trader, because we did have traders coming up into the back country, um, so they were available, you know, it wasn't very often, but I might have bought them for, you know, to, because I knew the trader would be in, you know, maybe every six months, so I bought enough that I knew I would use, and then of course you ran out, you ran out. Um, so they were being brought in, and you know you have to remember Charlestown was uh, was one of the biggest port cities. So more was being brought into Charlestown than than any other port city, I, I believe, in uh, the colonies. I believe if anybody you know, correct me if I'm. I know some of you are historians and other aspects. Um, so that so that's one of them. You know, they might make a trip too to a town like uh, where the Shield is. They talk about going across the Yadkin River and into uh, another town that they might have made that trip maybe every so many months, and where you could you had the availability of, of purchasing some of these items from a grocer or the store. Any other questions? Yes. How long did the uh, when they did the preserves? How long will that last? Does it have any refrigeration? Ah, a good question. Okay, so preserve. So a lot of preserving was done in um, either pickling, and they would pickle fruits in vinegars. Uh, you very common to have a vinegar, probably cider vinegar, because most people were making cider. They had apples. They make. They drink fresh cider. They make hard cider, and they would also make. Uh, they might have wine vinegar as well if they were had enough money to buy wine and continue that. So the vinegar will preserve for a long time. If you had like jams uh, and, that you were making, 
you could, what you would do is you put it in a crock, and then you would take a paper and soak that paper in brandy or some other alcohol, stick that right on top. And then, if you wanted to seal it for a long period of time, you'd actually fill that jar up with brandy so that it would create, you know, so the alcohol is going to act as a preservative. It's going to keep mold off and everything. And then you would cover the top of that with either a pig's bladder or um, a, a leather or paper, and that would further keep out any air, bugs, things like that. So, and you've got to remember that they probably would not have kept it. it. It would have been eaten up over the season, so it would have lasted long enough, and by the time spring comes, you've probably gone through all your stores of preserves. Mm -hmm. But how long would it take to make a meal and if so, how many, how many meals do the fam average family have each day? That's a good question. I'm not positive. If I were a farm family and it was, uh, we were doing, you know, it was high of season. You're either planting or you're harvesting. Chances are you were making, you know, whatever you ate in the morning, breakfast, which might have actually been dinner the night before. Um, pies, believe it or not, things like pies, your apple pies, your pumpkin pie, all of that would have been eaten as breakfast. Uh, that was very common. So it's not a dessert. We, we, desserts or sweets were very rarely eaten because sugar was so expensive. So that was a special treat. But if I had something like a pie, that's going to be breakfast. Um, and then I might, as a farm wife, you know, I might make one pot meal and it's just staying near the fire to stay warm, and as people were coming in from the fields or their work, they'll dish it out, eat, and go off and do what they do. So you didn't have a sit-down meal, per se. So that, that's probably more common for the average farm family. Um, and depending on what you're cooking, and you know, you didn't do elaborate, so you know, they talk about in the cookbooks very elaborate meals, but that would not have been commonplace. It would have probably been one dish or a meat and maybe a vegetable if you had it or meat and a bread, something so very simple, or pickles next to it, as you, as you, you know, from what I, I talked about. Mm -hmm. I used to store meat, yeah. other than salt, that was the name, that was the name. You could also, um, they would also um, take meat and put it in jars and cover it with fat. Um, so that was another way to preserve it. You could preserve eggs uh, several ways by uh, boiling them or preserving them in salt. It was another way to keep them fresh. There's a couple recipes for that. Uh, but also you got to remember like eggs, to keep them fresh, they didn't wash their eggs. And that's the problem we have today is that we wash the eggs. If you just gathered it, it already has a coating on it that prevents bacteria from getting into that, that shell. So um, in Europe, they, they don't wash eggs, they, and that's why they'll sit out on the counter and they're good for a month, you know. Um, so, so, you know, your dairy, like your butter, to preserve it, you'd add salt. Uh, your meats, you'd salt it down. After you ate it fresh, whatever you could, you make your sausages, everything, and then you're going to salt it, and then you're going to put it and smoke it, and that smoking will preserve it. There's some references that some people would say, oh, don't even touch that ham for at least six months or a year. That is no good to eat until it's sat and cured for that long. So. Yeah, and it's, you know, and sometimes you, they'll have references to soaking it in water, but a lot of times you just cut off that outer part anyways, and then what's in it is not as salty as you think it is. Um, I've made sausages, and I thought, oh, this is of salt. By the time you mix it in and it sits for a while, for some reason it doesn't, doesn't, it, it's not as salty as what it seems like it would if you just put that salt on your food and ate it. The smokehouse always smells so good. That's where the salt box was. Uh huh. It would immediately go to the salt box. Mm -hmm. It had, had to be a certain temperature the joints to rub the salt into it. The, uh, the joints would be small. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a technique to it. Yeah. There was a little science to it. Yeah, yeah. And they, they all knew that. And, and it never, and that method really hadn't changed for centuries. So, you know, like you're talking about it, say, it's the same method they probably they did in the 1700s as well. I can still smell that smoke. 
<laughs> no, so good. If it was probably cured, my dad would people would come and buy him and he would take him out there and he would kind of smell stuff on the car. And he'd be so cured that he'd be right there. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to do it. And um, you do find some places in Italy that still do that charcuterie that and they um, and they cure it and um, and they cure it the same way they've been doing it for hundreds of years and it's it's some of the finest um, you know meats that you can get. What was the uh, type of meat that was used in those times? So beef, possibly. Oh, I think you yeah, that, that's okay, because I kind of covered a lot of stuff, so we'll, we'll go back and cover it. So um, so beef, but beef not as often, probably because when you, um, you know, depending on the family, if you might slaughter that that um, that cow that's no longer giving milk, finally. Um, so the, they, they'd be very old, and, and uh, uh, a lot of pork, pork was very common, wild meats, um, chickens, but same thing, you know, the chickens or the roosters, the, 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 the ones that aren't laying anywhere, the old ones. So a lot of the meats were the old animals. Mutton is a good example of that. I'm raising the sheep. Well, as long as I can keep getting good wool off of that, I'm not probably going to eat it. Then when the time comes of that it's getting old, okay, we'll slaughter it. Now we've got mutton. So a lot of those meats were very tough. Um, Stringier. And that's why you find a lot of the receipts talk about cooking for long periods of time or larding. And larding is a method of taking uh, pork fat or like like your fat on bacon and stuff, and you take a large needle that has a little eye through it, and you actually pull it through the meat and pull that fat through the meat and leave it in there. And so it helps to add moisture and tenderize that meat. What do you have for us tonight? Yeah, so, okay, so we've got a couple of things here that you can try, and these are early receipts, so, uh, and I'll bring them back there so that you can serve it. So one of them that we have, um, these are called Shrewsbury Cakes, or Shrewsbury Cakes, and this is a, cakes referred to cookies, uh, a cake in this time period, and this is that deciphering the information. So deciphering the recipe. A cake can either be a cake that we think of as a cake, uh, which usually are much thinner. They're not the big fluffy cakes that, that we think of. They're much thinner cakes. Um, and, or they can refer to something that we consider a cookie. So this is a Shrewsbury cake. And this is uh, from Martha Washington's 1715 recipe. Are, they, they have spice in it. So that it has a cinnamon and mace, cloves, and sherry and um, rose water. So those are some common elements. Uh, we have a pumpkin pudding. I thought this would be very appropriate considering what's coming up. This is Mary Randolph's recipe from the 1700s for pumpkin pudding. So a pudding can refer to a pie like this. A pudding could refer to a batter that you would put in a cloth and then put down into a pot of boiling water and boil it. Or it can refer to a bread type pudding. How many of you have ever had bread pudding? Okay, so they would make bread puddings as well. Uh, it might be baked or it could be boiled. And boiling was a very common way to cook that. So think of your Christmas puddings, piggy pudding. All those were boiled with bread and spices and your dried fruits. Uh, so we've got that one. Curious to see what you all think. This is our family's favorite pumpkin pie or pudding that I make every year, and um, they don't like the more modern versions anymore since I've been doing that one. I also have um, this is a so this is a potato pie. Sorry, it's got a puff paste. Um, I'm not sure my puff paste. My puff paste didn't come out as nice as I. But this is, so this has potatoes and onions and apples in it with the spices. Uh, the recipe did call for eggs, but I don't like the hard boiled eggs in these. Um, I, I just don't like that taste. I prefer just the vegetables in that one. So we'll try that. 
The other thing I have back there in smaller amounts is the solid syllabus. Uh, this does have alcohol in it, so I will warn you, so don't if you don't want any wine and um, please don't pick it up. But it's it's a it's wine and lemon juice, cream and uh, sugar uh, beaten together, and then you put it in the glass after you beat it, and it begins to separate. You can see that separation there. Uh, so it is, and they do say that these will keep for up to a fortnight without refrigeration, and I actually do that at the holidays. I usually have these, and they're sitting on the buffet. My house is not real hot, so they, and they hold just fine. Uh, and then I do have a jar of pickles. So these are, these are, if you wish to try an early pickle recipe, these are burgerkins that we grow at Rock Mountain Science Center. Um, they're always wonderful, they grow them just for me. <laughs> and then I always have more than I can take. <laughs> so these are, the burgerkin was, is a little, you might know it's a cowcumber. Does anybody know what a cowcumber? Okay, so it's a little tiny, it's actually not even a cucumber, it's in the squash family. And it's a spiny little looking uh, cucumber. And so in the Caribbean islands, they would use it mainly for cooking like squash. But uh, the recipe, recipe books here talk about that the only thing they're good for are making pickles out of it. So, so anyways, I have that for you to try as well. So what I will do is I will bring the food back there and I'll start cutting it and then you are all welcome to try some of these and like your opinion, see what you think about it. Uh, I know our family has, I do a lot of the recipes, not only do I cook it at Broken Mountain, but I sometimes I cook it and take it home for my dinner, which is really nice. Um, but the, the, my, my family actually likes a lot of the foods from this time period, so I'll just go ahead. And you also have uh, cider back here? Yes, oh, we have spiced cider. Um, so hot apple cider was common. This, I did add a little spice, not a lot to this, but I'll take the lid off. It has some cinnamon and ginger. Uh, one of the recipes also uh, that I came across that I've done before is they recommend you put eggs in the cider to fortify it, and then you would pour it back and forth between two jugs until it gets frothy, and then it would be good to drink. So if you didn't heat your cider up, the other thing you can have is a long um, metal rod that you would heat up in the fire for like hot toddies, and you could heat that rod up and stick it down in your drink, and that would instantly heat your drink. So ales, things like that, that they mold wines if they didn't want to keep it heated on the fire. Well, thank you all very much, and I hope you enjoy the treats. Uh, so we'll take these back and, and start all trouble. Okay, so how many of you are actually going to attempt to start cooking some of these foods? <laughs> oh, come on. Yeah, you think it's fine.